Hello, and welcome to another edition of Legislative Update with Representative Tesha Voss. My name is Tom Ayers, and I'm the senior staff writer for the Vermont Standard newspaper, which puts this update together uh, every two weeks or so with Okemo Valley TV. Uh, welcome, welcome, Tesha, to another edition of Legislative Update. It's good to see you. It's great to see you, and thanks for having me here, Tom. It's great to have you here. Uh, today, I'm hoping we can unravel a bit of a, to use a mythological term, a Gordian knot, and that's the evolving situation with uh, revisions to Act 127, the legislature's uh, most recent effort at equalizing education funding statewide. Um, there's been a good deal of media attention in the last week or so about ongoing efforts by the legislature to uh, revise Act 127. Let's begin by explaining for our, our viewers the basics of Act 20, 127 as it exists mm -hmm. today and what its purpose was when it was passed in 2022. Great. Um, so Act 127 was trying to layer an, a, an additional layer of equity onto our already equitable funding system. And this is vitally needed, particularly for rural Vermont, because it costs more to transport kids when they are 35 miles away than it does when they're right across town, such as in Burlington. Uh, it takes more funding to educate kids that have extraordinary special education needs. We're not just talking normal special ed. We're talking almost one-on-one. Um, -on -one. You know, you're talking low or high-functioning autism. Um, so that requires an additional amount of money. We have English language learners, and that takes um, those children, uh, it, it takes them longer to get through their studies because they're also learning the language while they are completing their studies. So in order to do this, um, schools uh, basically do a count of how many of those types of issues that they have, and that allows them to receive more funding so that they can administer um, either the program or the transportation. So that is that's the goal of the program. Mm -hmm. That means that some schools are we're gonna they're gonna have more money be given to them to satisfy those needs, and other schools will uh, not have those needs, and they will be paying more. So, um, or they will have to reduce their their budgets. So that's what one twenty seven was trying to do in essence. And for those um, schools that would have to pay more or mm -hmm. to cut out of their budget because they don't have that those array of concerns, mm -hmm. they needed some time to adjust. And so the the bill created a five-year uh, on-ramp for them to make those changes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and that five-year um, on-ramp includes the, a 5% cap, correct? On Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, when this was, was, when this was modeled out, you know, one thing that's really important to note is that when, when any legislation is passed, but, you know, particularly when it's something um, as strong as Act 127, which was years and years in the making, you have the Vermont Principals Association, the School Boards Association, the Superintendents Association, the financial, uh, um, the uh, financial di directors at each school. Everyone's contributing towards supporting the legislature in how they feel it will best uh, come into being. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. When we were doing all of this study and trying to predict how this could roll out in the future, school budgets were just changing by two and three percent each year. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why five percent made the most sense. It wasn't something that most um, needed to to reach in order to just keep up with inflationary pressures. Sure. Well, all of a sudden we passed the bill, inflation shot through the roof. On top of the fact that we've had healthcare shoot through the roof and mental health needs in our schools shoot through the roof, and then we lost um, people in our designated agencies that come in and provide mental health services to our kids, and now we have this perfect storm of, even if a school budget now it's conservative for it to go up six percent, which meant everybody hit the cap, which made the cap meaningless, mm -hmm. and so it no longer did what it was supposed to do. And so now the legislature sat down with all of those same people in emergency meetings multiple times a day. I mean, this is truly great democracy at work because mm -hmm. no, we rarely see everyone work together 
as fast as it, as they do in a crisis. And it does show that uh, everybody's working as fast as they can to provide a solution that we know isn't going to solve things long term, but it will make it better right now. And that's mm -hmm. that that's what we know we can do. But we also are definitely looking to the fact that most educational funding systems last for about 10 years because mm -hmm. at the point of 10 years, you can kind of learn how to game the system, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. then they shift, right? Well, we've had a very equitable funding system that we haven't really yeah. needed to make those adjustments until we really saw we now have different pressures and we really do need to help, particularly with a lot of rural districts that did what, you know, Woodstock um, Woodstock junior high and high school did, which was, we didn't just merge our administration the way most schools did. We merged, we merged towns and districts. We closed schools and brought them here and we mm -hmm. need that extra money for that transportation. So mm -hmm. all in all, it's a good act, but we do have to figure out how to administer it better in this very, very unusual financial time we're in. So, so what have been the? Uh, you've touched on some of them. I, I infer from what you just said, but what have been some of the unintended consequences of um, of Act One Twenty Seven, and and what is the legislature now looking at doing to address those? So, where do things stand in terms of the tweaking? Great question. So, Act One Twenty Seven wanted to make sure that schools that needed that additional funding and that have never been able to receive it before got it immediately. And those that had to pay did not have to pay all of it immediately. So there was this on-ramp as I've spoken about. Yeah. And then that created a cap. Well, if the cap is at 5% and everybody was reaching that cap, what happened was that they could... They were trying to reduce tax rates in their town because everyone's crying, we can't afford this. Well, they would reduce their education spending and it didn't change their tax rate because this 5% cap functioned that way throughout the state. Mm -hmm. You would have to change to the tune of like millions upon millions upon millions of dollars to make a noticeable difference in the tax rate. And that meant that everybody just decided, well, if the tax rate's not gonna change, we're going to throw a bunch of um, absolutely needed construction updates into our budgets. Mm -hmm. And when you have 120 some school districts um, adding one to $5 million, that ends up being a $250 million hole in our ed fund. And that can't go on the backs of the ta property taxpayers mm -hmm. overnight. Mm -hmm. So absolutely. what, yeah. So what the legislature has done is used a, a term of art called a surgical approach. So if you uh, first, well, before the surgical approach, they sent out um, letters were sent out to school districts and superintendents and whatnot saying, if there is something that you can do in your school budget that wouldn't hurt you, meaning like we're not asking you to lay off 10 teachers here, but if you did something that is not absolutely necessary this school year, could you consider cutting it? And there are schools that I've definitely heard of that have that have done this. And we don't have the, the final number because this legislation is gonna allow the schools that are negatively impacted, meaning those that have to pay more or cut a whole bunch from their budget, instead of doing it on a 5% cap, we're allowing it to be a percentage difference of fiscal year 24 to fiscal year 25. So if you had a 1% change in spending, then you get a 1% break. If it's a 12% change in spending, then that's a 12 cent break. And then that is allowing you to be able to cut money from your budget and see a direct impact on your tax rate going down because of that. So let's take the example of uh, the Mountain View Supervisory Union, which they met, as I understand, the board had an emergency meeting a week ago um, on February 2nd, actually, a week ago Friday, to um, to uh, 
basically re redo their budget that's going before the morning, uh, going before the voters on town meeting day. Um, they, if I'm if I'm correct in, in, in picking up on what you just said, they pulled out about um, between five hundred six hundred thousand dollars in debt that they were going to repay and still stay under the five percent cap. Now they're they've backed that out. Is that correct? That is uh, correct from what I understand. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. I, I'm privy to some amount of information locally, but yeah. um, I, I've been hugely focused on my sure, job in Montpelier. Sure, so sure. I, I, I'm not seeing all the, the emails, but I was told that we made that adjustment. And yes. that is to, to ba basically do our part um, for the entire state of Vermont. Right, exactly, exactly. And um, <clears throat> uh let see here. Um, so, so they've done that. Are you aware of any other uh, districts in in the Upper Valley that might have opted to um, delay a budget vote, which was an option that school districts had? I am not aware I, of any, but... I am not aware of any either, except for that I would assume that Norwich would be um, a candidate that would want to rewarn their budget because mm -hmm. they are one of the hardest hit districts in the state by Act 127 um, mm -hmm. because they they don't have far distances to travel. Um, they don't have the extraordinary um, special education needs that some of the other schools have. Um, you know, they have a very high tax base. So, uh, but that actually doesn't even sort of um, it, uh, play into this one as much, but um, so I would assume that they would, but I have not heard for sure yet. Everything's moving at light speed. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It's, how much um, does the um, the adjusted level of um, uh, property value uh, factor into into this equation? Does that complicate matters, or uh, is that a whole separate issue? It, it really is uh, an entirely separate issue. So I actually am writing a piece um, in the standard this week, which I think hopefully explains this. Um, I kind of just went back in time to look at our education funding system and, and the reason why it had to change, which was mm -hmm. a Supreme Court ruling that mandated that school, uh, we if we're going to use our property taxes, we had to use them equitably. And so mm -hmm. that meant that we had to have a, a way to measure them equitably. And we couldn't just use the grand lists because a grand list could be have not been updated for years upon years upon years. And you could strategically decide not to up, update your grand list. Mm -hmm. So we had to ensure that everybody um, to the best degree possible used the fair market value for their house to determine their property taxes, which mm -hmm. would then mean how they contributed to the education fund. I see. Okay. Okay. So, will these changes go into effect um, immediately, or will these changes come later in the legislative session when you actually reconcile the differences and and pass the budget for the coming year? Where does it Where does it stand time wise? That is a, such a great question. So right now, the the legislation is sitting in the House um, Appropriations Committee because there is a small appropriation. Well, not small, five hundred thousand um, dollars. When you look at the entire Ed Fund, it seems small in comparison to two point whatever billion dollars. Um, yes. But that five hundred thousand dollars is sitting there so that towns can reborn budgets if they have sent out. Um, you know, early voting ballots, they can be resent out for towns that print their budgets, they can reprint. Um, so that is for basically our um, Secretary of State to utilize as, as towns need to, to um, complete their voting. Mm -hmm. Now, then it goes to the Senate and it goes through all of their um, committees of jurisdiction, though I will say more than ever, we have pre-communicated what's coming because we knew that we we don't have a lot of time for, for for this to sit. So this will move faster. We can vote to suspend rules so that um, 
you know, we we might still have to warn 24 hours before mm -hmm. it's read in the Senate, but if it passes, they could vote to not do 24 hours before third reading. Um, they could suspend and that vote again, send it straight to the governor. The governor is, has been in many of the, and his staff have been in many of these conversations. So the, the goal is to get that legislation passed as quickly as possible to ensure that everyone can adjust their budgets to fit the new legislation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then we still will have to go through the process of not having the yield set until much, uh, much later because the budgets do have to pass before we set the yield and the yield mm -hmm. determines how much we have to raise in final school budgets. So the schools tell us how much that, that the state needs to figure out how to spend in revenue or pay out. And so until we have those final past budgets, that will be when the final um, word goes down in terms of what our property tax rates are to found by town. Can you, can you define um, what, what you mean by setting the yield? Um, what, what is the yield? Oh boy, I hope I can. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to be clear here, house education, um, we deal with lots of educational matters, but we're not the experts in the education right. funding system right. because that's done in the Ways and Means Committee. But um, from it is basically, uh, all right, so you plant a crop and you it's it's beans and they grow all year and then the combine goes out and we combine up those beans and as it pours in to the um to get weighed that's how much we have yielded right okay so we know once we have all those budgets together we send it down and it gets weighed and that's how much we have to raise so basically the yield is how much we have to raise in money um, mm -hmm. And we do that through property taxes for homeowners, for all the other types of non-homesteaders. That's your your businesses, your second homes, your nonprofits. Some pay tax. Some towns opt out of that tax and pay it for them. And then we have meals and rooms tax. We have sales and use tax. Mm -hmm. um, and then some other very small taxes um, yeah. that are added in there. And so then we kind of, we play the game. How much can we how much are we going to get from all of those taxes um, that are not property based? And then when we have that number set and we know the total number, then we can say, OK, here's the property tax rate that we have to put on all the non homesteaders. And here's what we do on each individual town. Um, mm -hmm. And then that gives us the total amount of money. And that that's the that has to be the balance. The schools tell us how much to spend. We have to raise the money over here um, to make sure that they get paid. I see. I see. Is the yield in some way related to the weighted student um, figure? The weighted student figure tells a school district how much. OK, so if let's say that that an average school, uh, an average student um, First grade through sixth grade is a weight of one. And that's sort of like the level. Um, a school district gets paid less if you're a pre-K student. They didn't add the weight of pre-K into the, the study that they did when they determined, well, how much does it cost to educate a student? Um, so they're still working on that. We had to go mm -hmm. back to the drawing board. But for mm -hmm. high school students, it costs more to educate them than it does. And we're talking like normal run-of-the-mill students, like no extraordinary sure. needs at all. Because in high school, you are diving in deeper into your studies and you Absolutely. need more specialty avenues so that you can find the right career path in life. So mm -hmm. I forget the, the, I'm not looking at the weights off the top of my head, but let's say that that's one and a half. So if you're spending, just using rough numbers, $10,000 to educate a first through sixth grader, it's going to be $15,000 for you to educate a high school student. And then those additional weights go on top of that for transportation um, and for extraordinary needs and mm -hmm. English language learners. So that's mm -hmm. on top of just our normal base amount of money that we use to educate each different um, level of child, mm -hmm. age of child, excuse me. Excellent. Wow. I, did, I don't know if I answered your question. No, no absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. It's, it's, um, 
it's complicated, <laughs> clearly. And uh, un unraveling it for the average taxpayer, for the un uh, average member of the public that's looking at their tax bill is, 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 is a difficult thing to do. And hopefully we're 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 drilling into that difficulty a little bit here this morning, but um, it's we, uh, we definitely are drilling into it every day there. And I have to say, and I'm about ready. Uh, there's going to be a, a small amendment that's that's put on to this particular bill. I I'm pretty sure, which is not to change the bill at all, but to actually make a statement about public education. And that is, and I and and if that does come to pass, I will be speaking on it. And what I see in house education is that just because a service takes place inside the school, right now, the education fund bears the cost of all of that, mm -hmm. almost all of it. I shouldn't say all of it, but almost all of it. And what we need to do is look at it in a more community-based approach so that we can share services um, across the different silos that we have. Healthcare leans in, mental health leans in, agriculture leads in with food, transportation leans in. And we, if we don't start working together, we are not going to be able to bear these costs alone. And mm -hmm. being borne by just one style of tax on your home, that is what's so hard hard for Vermonters. That's what we need to fix. We need to make sure that not all of these come down on property taxpayers. Mm -hmm. We have lots of other taxes that are shouldered in many, many different forms. And that's what I'm looking at the most as a, as a legislator. Excellent. That's a, that's a great place to wrap up, Tasha. It's been a pleasure, as always, speaking with you and, uh, and, and informing our viewers about um, the latest iterations of Act 127 and, and education funding in the state. I'm sure it's a topic we'll come back to um, as this legislative term evolves. And uh, I want to thank you for being with us this morning. And uh, we'll see you uh, in two weeks. Thanks, Tom. It's always a pleasure.